God's people aren't directly responsible for the condition of the soil, but I believe we can hurt it or we can help it. And we're, if we're living as hypocrites and we're living far from God and we're not surrendered and we're not committed to Jesus, we can make that soil worse or better if by our, the, our faith and by our actions we are completely sold out for Jesus. And that's where verses like you reap what you sow come into play. If you reap faith and you reap good so seed, you're going to reap good fruit. But if you sow bad seed, you're going to either have bad fruit or no fruit at all. So ask yourself, what kind of fruit do you see from the people you're around? Have people been found or, or missed because of your faithfulness? And faith is the driving force in this situation. You see in Romans 10, 17, it says, So faith comes from hearing the good news, and people hear the good news when someone tells them about Christ. People coming to faith is either limited or enhanced by the, how the believers live out their faith around them. So if you're here, and you don't know why you're here, and you're like, man, I need something different, I need something better, and you're looking up to God, God, please help me. I want you to keep looking up to God, because that's where it starts. But I also want you to look around because there's someone who at one point came to faith who didn't know and someone communicated God's word to them. And there's someone maybe to your left or to your right in front of you, someone that invited you that can sit down and share what faith is biblically and how God got into their life. We are God's method for reaching the world. So I asked a few of my college guys to come up. Because I want you guys to see, I can talk about it all day, but I want you to see how God arranges the times and places for people to come to faith. Come on up, fellas. All right, hey everyone. All right, hey everyone, so uh, I'm Jake. Um, I'm in uh, campus ministry. So God arranged a time and a place for me, right? So before God, in uh, 2018, 2019, I moved to St. Louis to go to UMSL. Um, and before God, I was hopeless. I was addicted to drugs, to weed, alcohol, the, in the frat parties, all that, and really ran my life into the ground. Um, but I met TC, who was up here earlier, and a few other guys at a Super Bowl party on campus and was given an opportunity to start coming across Chad and my life, my life changed. Um, I was broken free from those drugs, that hole in my chest that I felt every day, every night when I would go to sleep, that hole of something missing was filled and my life was changed. And still to this day, God's working on my pride and on insecurities and other things, lust that I can struggle with, but he's taking me a long way. And then he brought me to a place, to a pool, um, where I was the boss. He worked for me. <laughs> and um, I met uh, one of my now best friends, Xavier, and um, God arranged a time and a place for Xavier and I to meet. So. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, before God, I was, you know, very angry. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, you know, very angry, um, very angry, very selfish, you know, addicted to porn and other stuff like that. And I remember, like, early in high school uh, is when I got into, like, a lot of stuff that, like, I look back on. I wasn't very, you know, close to God. I wasn't very happy, like, with my life. And I remember, like, in 2020, like, when COVID started and stuff, I had a big sickle cell crisis and went to the hospital for, like, three weeks. It was really bad. I remember after, I was super depressed and empty and just, like, looked at my life and saw that the things I was doing, like sports and girls and stuff like that, just wasn't worth it, you know. started seeking out God. I started, you know, never went to church, but started asking questions where I could and, you know, I remember um, the summer rolled around, and I worked at the pool recently, but like that the year before, and you know it was it was tough. Got into a lot of sand and stuff like that. And I remember going into the pool. I was like, man, it's not gonna be no accountability, you know, people there to support me. But then I met Jake, <laughs> and I had you know like a a cross uh, like wristband on, and I remember he asked me, he's like, are you a man of God? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what that means, but maybe. <laughs> And um, I remember we talked, you know, uh, we got to be vulnerable. He asked me, you know, a lot of questions, answer questions, and, you know, show me something different, what a real relationship with God looks like. 
I was still in high school at the time, so I remember he brought me around to the high school ministry and uh, studied the Bible with Ryan and, and Jake, and uh, you know, God arranged that time and place. And I remember uh, last semester, uh, I was in a math class, I was struggling, and had to go to tutoring and stuff, and that's where I met this guy, you know. So um, I'll let, you know, I'll let him. Yeah, so uh, I met Xavier like seven or eight months ago. And um, during this time period before I met Xavier, um, I was seeking God on my own and uh, didn't really have a lot of accountability in my life, just not a lot of people that want to live for God around me. And uh, I knew that that was something that I needed to make a change in my life. And, um, you know, I just felt that emptiness and my life just didn't feel like it was with purpose. Um, it felt like I was just doing it for me and um, not really trying to help other people. And uh, I had a conversation with one of my neighbors, and um, he was just telling me the importance uh, of, like, fellowship and having people around you that uh, want to live for God and uh, want to help you grow. And uh, I realized he was really right, and uh, I, I began praying that uh, God would send people in my life that want to live for Jesus. And uh, it actually happened later that week that I was struggling really bad in this math class, and uh, Xavier was probably struggling just a little bit more. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, just the one place I thought I'd never talk about God, we just, we just started talking about it. And um, he invited me to church. Um, and then uh, I came and he invited me to start studying the Bible with uh, him and TC. And, um, and soon led to me a couple months later being baptized. And um, as TC talked about, um, Azaria posted a video on social media and I shared it. And uh, Jack saw it and he was, we just started talking. And um, it really, it reminded me, though, that God arranged that time and place for me and Jack uh, in high school, long before uh, I really wanted to live for God, and it just led to a conversation, and uh, he wanted to be baptized, so uh, here's his story. Yeah, I'm Jack. Um, really, really thankful to have this family and be invited into it, um, but Matt right here helped me to get here, and I met him in physics class in high school, and you know, I think the common theme is it gets smarter as the line goes down, because Matt was struggling. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Matt and I would have some awesome talks about God in physics class, but I don't think either of us really knew what we were talking about, and we didn't have the people around us to help us get there. Um, and Matt and I reconnected uh, a few months later when I saw his post of his baptism, and he invited me here to the church um, and to this awesome family. And we really clicked. I loved it. Um, and I started studying the Bible with him and Xavier um, and just felt that, that brotherhood. And they really helped me become a disciple. Um, I was struggling with anxiety back in high school when Matt and I uh, met. And just God has helped me kind of overcome that. And he's working on me with my pride right now. But um, I can't wait to see where God puts me and the time and place he arranges for the next person that comes down the line and then the next person, the next person. So like I said, I could have said all that and whatever, but getting to see them and see their hearts and um, how it kind of goes down the line. But even before Jake, before me, before the campus ministry, before our church plant, there was another church, there was another church, there was another person, another person, and it all the way traces back to a man on the cross. And it started with Jesus. It's through Jesus. It's because of Jesus that any of this is possible. And it's Jesus that arranges those times and places for us to meet so that way we could come to faith. And like I said, God is calling out, here I am. Here I am. Come find me. I'm right here. I'm right here. Seek me with your whole heart. And when I think about Jesus, who he is, and his surrender on the cross and his death on the cross, I am eternally grateful. So here in a second, we're going to take communion. And I want you to look and know that the juice represents his blood that was shed for you and the little cracker the bread represents his body that was beaten and nailed to a cross and in second corinthians 5 verse 15 it says he died for us so that we will all live not for ourselves but for him who died and rose let's pray now, father god lord i want to thank you for jesus i want to thank you for who he who he is who he was god the life that he lived and being willing to be about your business and to be about your will, God. 
I pray that we can remember his sacrifice, that we can let it be the driving force for our life and the things we do. God, help us to, to seek out opportunities to share that message, that gospel, with other people. God, I pray that we don't take that sacrifice for granted, that we can live our lives solely to glorify you and to live by faith, God. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the church that he set up in the book of Acts and that there were faithful people over the last 2,000 years that helped spread your word and your message all the way here to St. Louis, Missouri, God. I pray that we're faithful to you and that we live for you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your grace still amazes me. Your love is still a mystery. Each day I fall on my knees. Your grace still amazes me. So continuing in Acts 2, or uh, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, he said he died for us so that we will live, that we will all live, not for ourselves, but for him who died and rose. So ask yourself, do you live for yourself or do you live for the one that died for you? And then it goes on to say in verse 18, all of this is a gift from our creator God who has pursued us and brought us into a restored and healthy relationship with him. And he has given us the same mission, the ministry of reconciliation, to bring others back to him. So we're on a mission, and we've been given a gift within that mission. But the cool thing is, is that gift isn't just a gift for us. It's a gift that we can give and share with other people. I can tell you, when I give a gift to someone, I love it whenever they use it for themselves, because it's like, oh, that's so cool. But whenever it's a gift that you can share, and you're freely giving that, I'm like, oh, man, because it not only makes one person's day or whatever but it makes all the people around them either have fun or enjoy it or whatever it is and God wants that for us he wants us to take that gift and then give it to others you have you can share it. you have the opportunity to share it but you also have the uh, the responsibility to share it sharing your faith is never guaranteed to be easy sometimes it'll feel like a burden sometimes it'll be a struggle but as a person of faith you have the responsibility to share it so first if I'm going to find the God who wants to be found it will involve people second it will involve reason 
It will involve reason. God doesn't want to have followers who have to check their brain at the door. I hear that all the time. You're just this mindless follower. There's no real reason for God. But as far as I can see, there are two options about how we were created. Either something came for nothing or something always existed. And let me rephrase it. Does it seem more reasonable to ask, did matter create intelligence or did intelligence create matter? And you look at like a car, like this engine, did the engine create the inventor? No, something had to like intellectually design that. And there's all kinds of just biblical evidence for the existence of God. In the book of Job, it talks about uh, the sphere, sphere of the earth, of the circle of the earth. Back then, people didn't know. I mean, Kyrie Irving still says the earth is flat. Now, right? And so back then, thousands and thousands of years ago, and Job is one of the oldest books, it says that it's suspended. Other religions say that the earth is on the back of a catfish, and that's why we have earthquakes. There's all kinds of different historical and factual evidences in the Bible. In Acts 17, verse 2, it says, On three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. If you are seeking God, it takes more than just getting in your heart. When we do those worship songs, I don't know about you, but whenever we were singing those worship songs this morning, my heart felt really full. And man, I can do anything for Jesus. And I don't know how many times I've seen people go to a Christian concert or even within the worship and are coming to church or going to camp and having this heart that's like, oh, yes, I can do it. But if that's as deep as your faith goes, just to your heart, what happens when that feeling isn't there anymore? We're not known to be a people, as humans, to make the best decisions when we're emotional. You look at marriages, right, that are, oh, I'm so in love, I have to marry this person, and there's no real substance to the marriage. And when that feeling wears off, and then you realize, oh, this is who I married, and this is hard, what happens? Well, a divorce rate of over 50%. And time and time again in the Bible, our relationship with Jesus is compared to a marriage. And it says it's a lifelong commitment. And if it's just based on emotion, you will fall away. Because the Bible compares Satan to a crouching lion. And he is ready to pounce. And he's waiting in the weeds for something to knock you off your faith. Because he knows that if your heart is gone or your head is gone, now is the time to pounce. And if you don't have a faith, if you don't have a faith that's grounded not only in your heart but in your head, when that emotion's gone, you're going to suffer. Marie and I have three wonderful kids. Before we had our three kids, we had two miscarriages. And miscarriages are rough. They're hard because whenever you find out you're pregnant, you start dreaming, you start hoping, you start looking to make names, and is this person going to grow up and look like me or hopefully her mom or or whatever it is or are they going to be a doctor are they going to be a teacher are they going to be whatever and you start dreaming and whenever that dream is not there it hurts and if your relationship with Jesus is just based on a feeling you don't stick around because I can have a miscarriage without God bad things can happen without God but when you're grounded in truth it sees you through the hard time or seven and a half years ago when my sister passed away that's a hard thing, and if you're not grounded, not only in your heart, but in your head, it's going to shake your faith, and the Satan is going to pounce. So as we get into that verse, I want you to circle reasoned, explaining, and proving. Reasoned, explaining, and proving. You see reasoned. It says Paul used uh, words to reason with him, with them, and he used the word reason several times. It was the idea of having a dialogue with the people, not talking or not shouting, but talking. And when in Romans 17 or 10, it says, when faith comes from hearing a word, if someone's going to find God, someone of faith needs to start a dialogue. Some conversations are easy. Boom, 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 and they get it. Some are more difficult. They can be intimidating. They can be hard. What if this person rejects me? What if they yell at me? What if they ridicule me? What if they mock me? What if they whatever to me? And it's, it's intimidating. 
But whether the dialogue is easy or hard, God expects us to have that dialogue. Because if faith comes from hearing the word, it takes a person of faith to have that. And that's why it's important for us to dig in deep and learn those reasons for God. If you all you're living on is a sermon from me or Ben once a week, you're not getting everything you need to be equipped to share the reason for the hope that you found. And that's why you should be digging into your Bible. That's why you should be listening to sermons. That's why you should be asking questions and digging in and growing your faith. So he reasoned, but he was also explaining. And that's a deeper form of reasoning. You've gotten past that initial dialogue, and now you get to explain the reasons that you found for Jesus. It's them opening their mind and improving. This is the spot where the heart combines with the head, and it's called conviction, and it moves you to action. It's the idea of laying down your case side by side with another case because your case is so strong, it's so superior, it's clear which one is better. You know, I watch like Suits and a couple of like these law shows. You have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So here in a few weeks, we have our crockpot cook-off. And it's where we put different dishes side by side, and we, there's a clear winner. Over the last few years, there's been a clear winner. <laughs> Maria, where you at? Maria. Maria makes this potato soup that's out of this world. And like every year, it's laid side by side by all these other dishes, and my wife's potato soup comes out as the best. And that's what <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'm yeah, I'm get, just getting some bony point, bonus points here, right? There's a clear winner beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's what Paul is doing here with God. He, and we're going to see as we move through this, is that he takes their, their beliefs, their faiths, their idols, he stacks them next to God and proves that God is God beyond a reasonable doubt. In fact, when he's talking later in Acts 26, he says this, Paul replied, know your excellency, Festus. I'm not crazy. I speak the words of truth and reason. Truth and reason. Not some half-hearted, I think, or I feel. I can refute, re refute your thoughts. I can refute your feelings. Anybody can. But when it comes down to truth and reason, objective fact, it's really hard to argue with that. He had confidence and conviction because he had truth and reason on his side. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says this, But dedicate your lives to Christ as Lord. Always be ready to defend your confidence in God when anyone asks you to explain it. However, make your defense with gentleness and respect. That gentleness and respect is key in this. Because as you start talking about beliefs, and sometimes beliefs that go not only back to the beginning of your life, but even beyond that, it can get very emotionally charged. And God is telling us, do this with gentleness and respect. So I've got some resources for you. Over the summer, at the Campus Ministry United workshop, we had a man come in by the name of John Clayton. He's got a website, doesgodexist.org. He was an atheist that wanted to write a book to discredit and disprove God. In the process, he found Jesus Christ. There's a, another book by a man who just recently passed away by the name of Timothy Keller called The Reason for God. And when I talk through and I say you need to dig in and know these things, these are resources for you to dig in, to know the reasons for God. Not just I think or I feel God is real or not real, but reasons to have faith. There's also another book by a man by the name of Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ. Another great book. They made it into a movie, and it kind of gives you the, the snapshots of his journey in that. But it's a book that moves through his case for Christ being real. A few years ago, I had a man in my uh, campus ministry by the name of Nathan Taylor. And Nathan was that guy who had um, a heart for Jesus and wanted it, but his head just did, didn't match up. And he doubted, and he doubted, and he doubted. And we were talking through what faith looks like. And I really encouraged him and challenged him in the best I could, try to walk alongside him in this. And I was like, you know what? I really think you need to just really dive into this stuff. I need you, 
uh, to do that. And so he did, and he started researching, he started reading, and he's like, it strengthened his faith, and it became, what was a weakness became like a passion of his. So I was talking with him, I was like, man, I really think you could teach this to other people. And he's like, for real? I was like, yeah, I totally see that for you. Why don't you come up with this, like, curriculum or things like that, and we'll add it to our monastic classes. And he's like, really? And I was like, yeah. And so I kind of left it at that. And sometimes you throw those ideas out there, and it's a really good idea, but for whatever reason, the person doesn't pick up the ball and run with it. A couple weeks later, Nate's like, hey, I found the curriculum. I was like, what do you, well, huh, what? He goes, yeah, I found it. I was like, you sure? He's like, yeah. So we got together, and we talked. I go, Nate, this looks really good. Let's do it. And he's like, yeah. And so now we do a Doubters Anonymous class. Because there's so many, yes, they, yes, yes. And he's single, and he's looking, and he's a man of God, and he serves, and he's awesome, and he can sing, he can do all that stuff. Total package right there, Nathan Taylor. And if you're having doubts about Jesus, look no further, he is your guy, right? Um, and he rides a motorcycle. Thank you, thank you. Um, that's right. Um, but he's become a man where that was a weakness, and now it's a strength. And he's a resource in the kingdom but more specifically, he's a resource within our family that if you're doubting, he's a guy that you can go to and say, hey, what about this? What about this? And if he doesn't have the answer, he knows where to point you to the right answer. And he's been a great man of faith. And we have plenty of resources here because God doesn't want us to check our brains at the door. He wants us to know not only in our heart but in our head that there's a reason for Jesus. So if I'm going to find the God who wants to be found, first, it will involve people. Then it will involve reason. And third, it will involve things that seem unreasonable. Wait, it's reason and then unreasonable. Yeah, sometimes it's just not going to make a whole lot of sense to us. But God's going to say, in faith, I want you to move through this. So not in your notes. There's a little reference to it. So if you have your phone and you want to like pull up the Bible verses, they're also going to have them here. Uh, it just wouldn't fit because we're going to do a large chunk of Scripture out of Acts 17. So starting in verse 16. While Paul was in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that, that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned. This is a different reason from when he reasoned with the people earlier in Acts 17. New town, same thing. He goes into the synagogue with both Jews and Greek fearing, God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Paul reasoned with the Jews, those who already had religion. He reasoned with the God-fearing Greeks, the ones that were open to it, but not quite there yet. And then he reasoned with people that were in the marketplace that had no real commitment to Jesus. And it just goes to show that the gospel is for everybody. A relationship with Jesus is for everyone. It says a group of Epicurean, and these were followers of Epicurus, they were taught that pleasures and happiness was the chief goal to all of life. And when the body dies, all life is over, there's no resurrection. And Stoic philosophers, these pantheists, who thought that life's goal is harmony with nature and its laws. They worshiped the, the control of one's emotions and believed that logic was more important than love. And when you're old or sick, because you had control and you had logic, it was better for you just to end your life than to, to die of old age or of sickness. So they advocated for suicide. And those two points are important for later. It says they began to debate with him. And some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? God never commanded us to be good at sharing our faith. Thou shalt share your faith perfectly. Never command, never even hinted at. They were calling him a babbler. They were calling him a seed picker or someone that was kind of picking out different truths and not really hitting on it, and they were questioning his depth. And when you look at who was talking, this is Paul. They were questioning Paul's depth. And questioning the source of the material is a good thing. You should be doing that because it's what you believe in and it's what you're going to stand before God to give an account for. But they were questioning Paul's depth. But Paul knew that he was commanded to share his faith, even if he was going to be rejected, even if he was going to be mocked, even if he was going to be called a babbler and questioned, he was commanded to share his faith, and we need to continue that in our lives, because we're going to have people we work with, family members, friends, people wherever we go that aren't going to respond, or we're going to get in the middle of it, and we're going to chirp over our own words, we're not going to know what to say, we're going to get insecure, and we're going to shut down. 
And God says, no matter what the reason, we need to go out and share our faith. We need to continue Paul's example. Sharing faith in Scripture is a command, not a gift. He goes on to say, others are marked. He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Which, remember, the Epicureans believed that once you died, there was nothing after that. So the resurrection was kind of unreasonable for them. It says, they took him and brought him into the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. The Areopagus is the place of learning, is the place to sit down. When I think of like the old Greek philosophers, it was like, well, I think this. And they would go on this thing, and Plato and Socrates and all this, that was that kind of place. It was also a place of one point of judgment. Verse 20, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So after this uh, sermon is over, and they may have already done it, on our social medias, I made this graphic that kind of explains the story in depth. And I, I put it out because I want people to know the background of this part of scripture. You can put it on your phone. You could do, use it as part of your quiet time. It's just an additional resource for you. But I'm going to kind of give you the cliff notes of that, that infographic that, that we made. 600 years before Paul goes to Athens, Athens was faced with a plague. It was destroying their community, and hundreds of people were dying. The leaders were calling for sacrifices to appease one of their hundreds of gods. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Confused as to why their sacrifices weren't working, the leaders contacted a Pythian priestess. They were told that the city was under a curse because the treachery of one of their former kings. One of their former kings had made an agreement with